Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, today, as you're probably anticipating, I will confirm some careful and cautious changes to the current lockdown regulations. Uh, I will set out what those changes are in a moment, but I want to begin with a simple but really important point. The only reason we can make any changes today is that we have made progress in suppressing this virus. And that is entirely down to the sacrifices that all of you have made. So more than ever today, I want to say thank you to each and every single one of you. I'll come to the changes themselves in a moment. And because there's a lot to cover today, my update will be a bit longer than normal. But first, of course, I will provide the usual statistical update. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,288 positive cases confirmed. That is an increase of 48 since yesterday. A total of 1,238 patients are in hospital with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That represents a decrease of nine overall from yesterday, including a decrease of 13 in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 37 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. Uh, that is a decrease of one uh, since yesterday. Uh, I'm also able to confirm today that since 5th of March, a total of 3,635 patients who had tested positive for the virus have now been able to leave hospital. Unfortunately, though, in the past 24 hours, 12 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,316. Now, I feel very strongly, as I'm sure you do, particularly today as we start to talk about the first steps out of lockdown, that we must never become inured to these statistics and we must never ever forget that behind every single one of them is a person who was loved and is now deeply missed. In future we will want collectively as a nation to remember and mourn that loss. But for now let me send my condolences to every family who has lost a loved one to this virus. Let me also express my deep gratitude to our health and care workers for the incredible work you have done and continue to do in such extraordinarily difficult circumstances. The figures I have just given remind us that the progress we have made so far is real, but these figures also remind us of the toll this virus has taken and that our progress remains fragile. The virus is still proving fatal for too many. Hundreds of people are still in hospital and new infections are still being identified in most health board areas. As I said before, that means we must proceed with the utmost care and caution. Nevertheless, a downward trend in COVID-19 cases is now sustained and unmistakable. As you know, the law requires us to formally review the lockdown regulations at least every three weeks and to keep them in place only for as long as is necessary. And the latest review period ends today. I can confirm that we have considered the latest evidence of the spread of the virus and I can report as follows. The R number, uh, the transmission rate of the virus, remains in a range of 0.7 to 1. We can't be certain how far below 1 it is and that confirms and underlines that we must continue to exercise caution. However, we have uh, now reasonable confidence that the R number has been below 1 for a period of more than three weeks. Our modelling also shows that the prevalence of the virus is reducing. Uh, last week, you might recall that I reported an estimated 25,000 infectious cases across the country. Our latest estimate is that as of last Friday, the 22nd of May, there were 19,000 infectious cases in Scotland. In addition, the number of patients in intensive care has fallen by 80% since the peak, and the number of new hospital admissions has fallen by more than 80%. Also, as we saw yesterday in the National Records of Scotland report, deaths associated with COVID-19, uh, both overall and in care homes, have now declined for four consecutive weeks. This evidence has allowed the Scottish Government, therefore, to conclude that we can now move into phase one of our four-phase route map out of lockdown. My confidence in that conclusion is bolstered by the launch today of Test and Protect, our system of test, trace, isolate. 
We're now asking any person who has symptoms of COVID-19, that is a cough, a temperature, or loss or change of taste or smell, to take immediate steps to book a test. If this applies to you, please go straight to nhsinform.scot to get a test. Or if you can't go online, call NHS 24 on 0800 028 2816. Don't wait to see if you feel better before booking a test. And apart from going for the test, you and all uh, people in your household should self-isolate. If you are contacted by Test and Protect to say you've been in contact with someone who has tested positive, please follow the advice to self-isolate for 14 days. But remember, and this is a really important point, that you can minimise the chances of that happening by taking care not to be a close contact of someone outside your own household. And that means staying at least two metres distant from anyone who is not part of your household. Test and Protect will be a crucial part of our efforts to control this virus in the weeks ahead, but it will not do it, cannot do it on its own. The decisions that all of us make about staying two metres apart, washing our hands, wearing face coverings in enclosed spaces, these matter just as much. In many ways, in fact, they will matter even more as we start to slowly relax these lockdown rules. If we don't pay close attention and follow physical distancing and hygiene rules, those 19,000 estimated cases I mentioned earlier will quickly rise again. However, all of that said, we are now in a position to make careful changes, and I want to set out now what those changes will be. Many of these changes will come into effect tomorrow. We are publishing on the Scottish Government website specific guidance to help you understand the changes and also the rules that we are still asking you to follow. So please take the time to read that. The focus of our phase one changes is on outdoor activity. And the reason for that is this, as long as people from different households remain two metres apart, don't touch the same surfaces and wash hands and surfaces regularly, the risk of the virus spreading is lower in an outdoor environment than it is indoors. Even so, in making changes at this stage, we have limited room for manoeuvre. So we need to get the balance right. Of course, we want to restart the economy as quickly as possible, but we have also kept very firmly in mind the things that matter most to our quality of life, family, friendship, love. I'll therefore spend most of my time today talking about what these changes will mean for your ability to interact with friends and family. But first, let me cover what they mean for business and public services. From tomorrow, most outdoor work that has been put on hold can resume and the construction industry will be able to restart site preparation. That's the first phase of its restart plan. It will require to consult further with government before moving on to the second stage of that plan. From tomorrow, garden centres and plant nurseries can reopen some of their services and we will no longer be discouraging drive-through food outlets from reopening as well. However, non-essential shops and pubs, restaurants and cafes, except for takeaway, must remain closed at this stage. Household waste recycling centres can reopen from Monday uh, and guidance on this was issued yesterday. We continue to ask other business premises to remain closed at this stage unless providing essential goods and services and we ask all businesses to let staff work from home wherever possible. From Monday onwards, uh, the 1st of June, teachers and other staff will be able to enter schools for the purpose of preparing for a reopening of all schools on the 11th of August for a, a blended in-school at home model of learning. And from next Wednesday onwards, that's the 3rd of June, childcare will be available to a larger number of children who most need it, for example, vulnerable children and children of essential workers. Childminding services and fully outdoor nursery provision will start to reopen from next Wednesday too. However, there will continue to be limits on the number of children that can be cared for and guidance for childminders will issue on Monday. During phase one, some key public services, for example, some respite care, children's hearings and some key health programmes will also begin to restart their work and further announcements on timing will be made in due course. In terms of sport and recreation, some non-contact outdoor leisure activities will be allowed to restart again from tomorrow. 
This applies to activities where you can safely keep a two metre distance from others at all times and follow strict hygiene practices. For example, golf, tennis, bowls and fishing. You will also be able from tomorrow to sit or sunbathe in parks and open areas. I'm sure that will be welcomed by many, particularly in this weather, but it will be welcomed especially, I suspect, by those who don't have gardens. And you'll be able to travel, preferably by walking or cycling, to a location near your local community for recreation. However, we are asking you for now to please stay within or close to your own local area and don't use public transport unless it is absolutely necessary. Now, we're not setting a fixed distance limit in law, but our strong advice is not to travel further than around five miles for leisure or recreation. And it is still the case that you should not go to our island communities except for essential reasons. We simply don't want in this phase to see large numbers of people at tourist hotspots or local beauty spots. Crowds of people, even if they're trying to socially distance, bring more risk than we judge is uh, acceptable and safe at this point. So if you do go somewhere and you find it is crowded, please use your judgment, change your plans and go somewhere else. Now, the final area I want to talk about is social interaction. But before I do that, I want to say something specifically and directly to people who are shielding, the people who are most vulnerable to this virus. You're now well into your third month of being advised not to leave home at all. And I know that listening to today's, to today's changes, which don't yet bring a change to your own circumstances, will be particularly hard for you. So I want to assure you that we will be providing you with more information and guidance in the next couple of weeks. And we will be trying as far as possible, as far as safe, to move to less of a blanket approach, one which requires all of you to stay at home all of the time, to one that more reflects your individual circumstances. We know the impact that our advice is having on you and on your loved ones uh, is significant. And we're doing everything we can to get that advice right so that you can safely, uh, albeit gradually, start to lead a less restricted life. And I want you to know today that you have not been forgotten and you are a central part of our thinking as we consider how we move forward. More generally, though, we can today confirm changes to the rules on meeting socially, and this, I know, is something everyone has been eagerly anticipating. From tomorrow, the regulations on meeting other people will change. You and your household will be able to meet with another household out of doors, for example, in a park or in a private garden. We said last week this should be in small groups. And to give you greater guidance on that, we're asking that the total number of people between the two households meeting up should be a maximum of eight. Please keep it to less than that if you can. Now, we're not saying that you must pick uh, one household and only meet the same one during phase one, but we are saying that you should not meet with more than one other household at, the at a time. And while this will not be the law, we also strongly recommend that you don't meet with more than one other household per day. This change will obviously allow us to meet with more people than we can right now. But please remember that we should still be meeting far fewer people outside our own household than we would in normal times. Now, I know how much all of you will be looking forward, all of us will be looking forward to seeing family and friends for the first time in a while. But how we do this is going to be really vital. Before you meet up with people from another household, you should stop, think, read the guidance and make sure you are protecting yourself and others. In particular, you must stay outdoors and stay at least two metres away from people from the other household. That is crucial. You should also avoid touching the same hard surfaces as they do. And let me give a specific example of that. I suspect many of you will be planning a picnic or a barbecue this weekend. If you are, not only should you stay two metres apart from those in the other household, but each household should bring its own food, cutlery, plates or cups. Don't share these things. And please don't go indoors. Being in someone else's house should still be avoided unless, of course, you're providing support to someone who is vulnerable. And that means thinking in very practical terms. 
We are not putting a legal limit on how far you can travel to meet another household, but please use your good judgment. If the distance is so far that you would have to use someone else's bathroom, then perhaps you shouldn't be doing it. And the reason for all of this is simple, but it is worth repeating because I'm not uh, putting all of these restrictions or asking you to put these restrictions on your activity for no reason. Uh, and the reason is, is this, if you go inside a house or if you share items, if you touch the same surfaces as another household or come within two metres of each other, that is when you are creating an opportunity, a bridge, if you like, for the virus to spread from one household to another. And that is what all of us must still do everything we can to avoid. Now, I know the information I give at these briefings uh, sometimes must be hard to absorb, uh, but today's information is really vital. So please watch this back later to make sure you've caught all of it and please read the guidance that you will find at www.gov.scot. What I have announced today are important first steps back to some kind of normality, I hope, but they are by necessity cautious. I've said before that no changes are risk-free and there are no certainties in any of this. But I've also said that I wanted to ensure that with every step we do take, the ground beneath our feet is as solid as possible. And that is what we are taking care to ensure. But I don't mind um, admitting to you that as we take these first steps, uh, I do feel a bit nervous. Uh, I worry that the limited changes we are making to these rules, uh, the very careful changes, might lead to much greater change in reality. And so I really need your help to make sure that is not the case. I am sure there are going to be lots of emotional reunions this weekend. You'll be planning to see family and friends that you haven't seen for weeks. And based on the current forecast, the sun will be shining too. We've all waited a long time for this, so I, I hope you all really enjoy it. But please, please respect the parameters we are setting out be respectful of each other's space and make sure things still feel different to normal because they should still feel different to normal. Above all, remember that each individual decision we will take will affect the safety and the well-being of everyone. Make sure that love, kindness and solidarity continue to be our guiding principles. So to recap, still stay at home as much as possible. The virus has not gone away. Lockdown is being modified slightly. It is not over. Make sure you're still seeing far fewer people than you might normally do. Don't meet up with more than one other household at a time. Don't meet more than one a day and keep to a maximum of eight people in a group. Stay two metres apart when you do meet. And that, I know, will be really difficult, perhaps the most difficult part of all. The instinct to hug somebody you love is a really strong one especially when you haven't seen that person for quite some time. And I know that for some couples who live apart, for example, uh, for them, this is even more difficult. And I want to assure you that we are considering that uh, point very carefully. But for now, whether it's parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles, siblings, partners from other households, don't put your loved ones or yourself at risk. Also, wash your hands regularly and thoroughly, avoid hard surfaces and clean any that you are touching. And if you have symptoms, get tested and follow the advice on self-isolation. Uh, to end where I started, we are only able to take these careful steps towards a less restricted lifestyle for all of us now because all of you have overwhelmingly stuck to the rules so far. And the truth is we will be able to take more steps more quickly in the future if we all continue to do the right thing, stick to the rules, and most importantly of all now, exercise good judgment at all times. I want to thank you again for all you've done so far, but thank you in advance for continuing, as I know you will, to do the right thing. And remember that this is all about protecting not just ourselves, it is about protecting each other. And though these changes are small at this stage, I really hope they do make a positive difference and leave all of us with a real sense of hope that we are on the right track, the track towards greater normality, where we continue to beat this virus along the way. 
Uh, thank you very much indeed for listening. Uh, as I said, that was longer uh, than normal, but it had important ground to cover. Uh, in the interest of time, we're now going to go straight to questions from journalists, although, as you will have seen, I'm joined by the Chief Medical Officer and the Health Secretary, who, of course, uh, will be answering questions with me. Uh, but I'm going to go to the first question today, which is from Glenn Campbell at BBC Scotland. First Minister, it still says stay at home in front of you. Do you really mean that when you're giving us so many new reasons to get out and about? Uh, yes, right now, uh, that is the, the fundamental foundational message. And I, I know as we go along, this gets more complicated and we have to make sure our messaging keeps up with that. But as I said in my remarks, I am still asking you to stay at home as much as possible. There have always been exceptions to that, going out for food and medicine, going to essential work that you can't do at home, um, and exercise. What we are doing today is adding some more exceptions to that, the ones that I have covered. But when you're not doing any of that, the advice is still to stay at home as much as possible. As I say, that will uh, undoubtedly evolve in the weeks ahead, but it's really important that we don't get ahead of ourselves and we take these steps, hopefully with a, a sense, as I said, of optimism and hope and positivity, but we don't forget to take them carefully and cautiously. This virus is still out there and we cannot forget that. Uh, and if we do forget that, the danger is that it will run out of control again. So please uh, read the guidance uh, on the, the website uh, and pay close attention to the parameters of what we have set out as changes today. Uh, Gordon Cree from STV. Throughout this whole process, supermarkets which exist to sell food have been able to sell clothes. Now garden centres which exist to sell plants are able to sell clothes. But people who run independent retail shops that sell clothes have to remain closed. They tell us that's unfair. What can you say to them? Look, I appreciate that for lots of people, individuals as well as businesses, there will be all sorts of aspects of this that feel... Uh, unfair, that, that feel as if they're anomalous. And given the situation we are uh, facing and have been in, perhaps some of that is unavoidable and inevitable. We try to make this as fair as possible, but we're trying to beat a deadly virus right now, and therefore that has to be our priority. We've had to have supermarkets open because people have to have uh, food, uh, but it is not as essential to go to a clothes shop when you can still shop online. Uh, so these are distinctions that we are making right now to try to keep the overall interaction of people and the footfall out in uh, retail as low and as minimised as possible. Now, we will gradually start to increase that. I don't want, because I want people to focus on the phase one changes today, so I'm not going to get drawn into future phases, but you can look at the, the route map that we published a week ago today, which shows that uh, gradually we want to see non-essential retail open. But if we don't do this carefully, if we don't do this with uh, small steps to start with, the danger is all of this will end up being closed again uh, because we will have allowed the virus to run out of control. So I ask for people's forbearance and patience. I know it's frustrating and I know it gets more frustrating, not less, as we go on. Uh, but just as people have done so far, listen to this advice, abide by it, act re responsibly and in the right way for the right reasons, I ask people to continue to do that. I want to see the economy operating again as quickly as possible, but I'm not prepared uh, to put people's lives at risk unnecessarily. We've got to continue as we have been doing, taking careful, cautious steps with the confidence that as we do that, we are absolutely going in the right direction. James Matthews from Sky News. Thanks very much, First Minister. I know you've addressed the Nike conference in Edinburgh at the end of February, but on a day when we're being asked to trust in the, the contact tracing system, I have a related question. We carried an interview yesterday with Gillian Russell. She's the kilt fitter who fitted up to 10 Nike delegates. Uh, she describes it as an up-close and personal process, measuring and so on, taking more than one hour. She subsequently had flu symptoms, travelled abroad to Portugal, was in contact with vulnerable people, vulnerable people, went to a retirement do, which she said she would not have done. My question is not about patient confidentiality or the, the non-publicising of the Nike outbreak. My question is about Gillian Russell. In this city, she had probably the longest and closest contact with Nike delegates who may have had coronavirus. 
she wasn't contact traced. Is that an endorsement of the contact tracing system or a failure of it? Um, James, I am not a contact tracer. I am not a public health expert, um, but I trust the people that do this work for us. Um, you know, the, the teams that work in Health Protection Scotland and local health protection teams across the country. It is their job, based on their expertise and judgment, uh, to trace and track people uh, that they uh, define as being in a close uh, contact situation. I, I, I'm not going to get drawn into individual uh, circumstances here because it is the people that we trust to make these judgments that we should uh, enable to make them. And that is uh, going to be really important uh, going forward. And, and it will continue to be important. I would say one other thing about uh, Nike and generally, and it's something I mentioned in Parliament a couple of weeks ago, that uh, you know, the scientists who work with Health Protection Scotland have been doing uh, work looking at the, the genomic sequencing of the, the particular strain there. And when that work is uh, concluded, we hope to be able to uh, share that. Uh, and that will tell whether there was any uh, onward transmission from the cases that we know uh, were infected during that conference. I think beyond that, I have... Uh, on many occasions uh, at length, um, as everybody has a right to expect me to do, uh, talked about the, the judgments and the decision making around uh, Nike and, and I don't uh, today have anything to add to that. Uh, Sarah Smith from BBC News. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I too have been speaking to Julian Russell, the kilt shop manager who um, fitted the Nike delegates uh, during that conference. Uh, and I don't want to ask you about the specifics of her case, but just in order that people can try to have full confidence in your test and protect regime. Can you tell us, have you changed the guidelines for who will be contacted after someone has tested positive for coronavirus so that they're now different to that which was in operation in late February, early March when the Nike conference happened? Uh, Sarah, I don't think you joined uh, the media update on Tuesday when I set this all out in some considerable detail, but I'm happy to cover this particular point for you um, since obviously you didn't uh, get it then. Um, and I'll hand over to Gregor, who'll talk a bit more about the, the definitions of contact. So the definition of a contact uh, for test and protect uh, is threefold. Uh, firstly, it would be members of your household. Uh, secondly, face-to-face -face contact, which Gregor went into detail about on Tuesday in terms of what that means. And thirdly, uh, if you have been within two metres of somebody for a period of 15 minutes uh, or more. These are not uh, rules that we just dream up out of nowhere. These are based on a uh, very uh, detailed assessment of the, the public health risks and also of course are based on a development uh, the developing knowledge we have of this virus and how it transmits so i'll hand over to gregor who can say a little bit more about that i think that's right there's three levels of contact which we're particularly interested in those people who form a household and that might be what we think of conventionally as a household in terms of families living together it might be people who share communal facilities and uh, and live together in in accommodation with perhaps shared kitchens or or, or, or something like that. So, so that's the first level. And if you fall into that category and you've had contact with someone who has tested positive, you'll be contacted by one of the contact tracers. The second level are those who have had face-to-face -face contact. And how that's defined is if you've had any kind of uh, contact with someone within one metre for, for any length of time. Important to specify, we're not talking about someone who's walked past you in the street in those circumstances, but where you've been able to have that kind of face-to-face -face interaction uh, with, with someone uh, and, and perhaps even um, physical contact with someone. Again, that would be a circumstance whereby you would be expected to be contacted by a contact tracer. And then this third category whereby if you've been within two metres of someone for a period of 15 minutes or longer, again, you would be um, thought of as someone who would be a increased risk of having contracted uh, the virus from someone who has tested positive and you would be contacted in those circumstances. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Can I, can I just come in with one yeah. clarification there? Because I've been looking through the um, guidance that there was published on the 10th of March, which is presumably what was applied after the Nike conference, and the definition of a face-to-face -face contact isn't there. So has that been a change to the guidance? We'll go into that face-to-face -face mm -hmm. contact in much more detail now so that there's a full understanding um, with uh, contact tracers as to what is meant by that. OK, uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you very much, First Minister. Uh, can I take you back to uh, test, trace and isolate and support? Uh, as, as you know, uh, quite a large number of people go back and forward across the England-Scotland border. Uh, it works both ways. 
So when it comes to testing, tracing and isolating, will you be able to share information uh, with your colleagues, presumably NHS England about this, and who then will be responsible if someone has uh, perhaps caught the disease in one place and lives in another, who will be responsible for the testing, the tracing, the isolate and the support? I'll hand over to the Health Secretary to say a bit more, but the short answer to that is yes, and these are not new arrangements. Test, trace and isolate is a system that we are now doing at much greater scale, but it is not a new approach. It has been used for a long, long time for infectious diseases. Health experts are well uh, versed in, in using it. So in terms of cross-border, and um, to go back to the, the Nike example, that was a, a, a case in point where there were people from England at that conference and they were... the. The, the contact tracing for them it was done uh, by Public Health England or by the, the local arrangements there. So uh, information sharing and cooperation and collaboration around these things is a, already a standard part of that approach and will be uh, through Test and Protect. Do you want to add anything? So if I just give you an example, if someone lives in Dumfries, for example, and they test positive but they cross the border for work purposes, perhaps, uh, then the... Uh, local health protection team for uh, Dumfries and Galloway would be pursuing that in terms of the contacts that person had had in Scotland and around the Dumfries area or wherever else they had been. But also, obviously, there may have been contacts uh, in, uh, in Carlisle and around uh, the north of England, wherever they had gone, and they would be liaising with Public Health England and their uh, protection teams to make sure that that information was exchanged, exchanged really quickly, uh, so that they could then get on and trace contacts themselves from there. So that is how, and it would work the other way uh, if it was someone who lived in Carlisle but worked uh, in Dumfries. So that's how it works, and as the First Minister said, uh, this is not a new system. This is a system that uh, operates uh, all the time when we are dealing with infectious diseases. It's now the case, though, that it will be operating at a much larger scale than is normal. Thanks. Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. Our station, West FM, is hearing the concerns of residents and large who are worried that the releasing of some of these restrictions combined with the great weather We'll see people flocking to their area, uh, particularly this weekend. Um, and I'm sure residents and other beauty sports across Scotland will have the same sorts of concerns. Now, I know the guidance asks us to stick within the uh, five miles. Um, but with this kind of weather and with the easing of restrictions, how realistic is it to expect people to stick within that five miles? And what would be your message to residents who are worried about an influx of visitors? Well, how realistic is it? I think it's very realistic for me, based on my experience in the last few weeks, to expect people uh, of Scotland to do the right thing, because that is what they have been doing, and to follow the advice, the rules and the guidance that we are giving. So let me repeat that. We do not want people flocking to beauty spots and, and tourist hotspots, however tempting it may be, particularly this weekend when the forecast is uh, looking as good as it is. Uh, and that's why we have said, well, it's not a, a fixed limit in law, uh, the, the five mile guide is one we want you to, to, to pay attention to and, and to follow. Uh, so stay within your local community or very near to your local community. And if you uh, go somewhere and you find there is a big crowd of people there, then for your own safety, come away and, and go somewhere else or come back later. Crowds of people, uh, I said before uh, and covered it today, the risk of outdoor transmission is lower than the risk of indoor transmission. But even outdoors with people trying to socially distance, crowds of people are riskier than we think it is safe uh, at the mo uh, to, to, to bear at the moment. So uh, please don't do it. And as I said last week, increasingly as we go into uh, phase one, as we are now doing, and beyond that, we will rely more on people's good judgment. Uh, that is inevitable. But of course, if, if we ever, and I'm not expecting or anticipating this, but if we find that people are not following the guidance and exercising that good judgment and the risk of the virus spreading is growing, then we will have no alternative but to start to put some of this into regulations and law. I don't want to be in that position. I don't expect to be in that position because I've got every faith uh, that people across the country will do the right thing. Inevitably and by necessity, we will be monitoring the impact of all of these changes to make sure that it is not leading to an increase in any of these indicators that I've spoken about. And if it does, then that will mean we can't uh, go into future phases as quickly as possible. And if it really runs out of control, we will have to pull back again. 
we're all, we've all got a part to play here, each and every one of this. I, I've said all along, I can't do this, the Scottish Government can't do this on our own. We will only succeed here if we all do what we have all been doing, and that is follow this guidance. The, the new guidance, uh, amended to take account of what I've covered today, is on the Scottish Government website. So please, before you do anything that you haven't been doing over these past few weeks, read that guidance and get a sense in your own mind of what the parameters are. That way we can loosen this up, but still stay safe so that we keep going in the right direction. Uh, Fraser Knight from Global. Minister, just for some clarity on contact tracing, you're saying that um, people who are within two metres for 15 minutes or longer will be part of that, the, the group of people who are contacted. If we look at some workplaces where, you know, staff and colleagues are two metres apart, but they're working together for eight hours at a time, we've got people who may be sharing bathroom facilities, who may be sharing kitchen facilities. Can you clarify that if someone in an office was to test positive for the virus, would all of their colleagues then be asked to also self-isolate for 14 days? Will we see entire offices being asked to, to stay off work and work from home for two weeks? I'll hand over Greg, uh, to Gregor in a moment, but the, the, the definition of a contact that we have set out is, is the definition of a contact. Beyond that, contact tracers are experienced people and uh, rather than uh, me making these judgments, they will be there to make the judgments about uh, who should be traced uh, and contacted and, and who shouldn't. And the point we keep making is that, of course, we're recruiting and accessing more of these, but this is a tried and tested uh, methodology, and, and we need to trust those uh, who have that job and have the experience, and we'll be building the experience of that to do that. Uh, but the point I, I keep making is, is this one, and I think it's really important to, to hear this, that we can all minimise our chances of having to self-isolate by trying not to be in the definition of a close contact. And that means maintaining the physical distancing of two metres. Um, and that is really important. There should be very few, um, not none, be because of obvious reasons around essential work, but there should be very few circumstances right now, if we're all following the guidance, that we should be within two metres of each other uh, for 15 minutes or more. So let's stick to that. And then we continue to see this virus reduce and reduce the chances of people having to self-isolate for that 14-day period. Gregor, do you want to say more? So the more people stick to the guidance, the more people continue to adopt the, um, the, the kind of public health measures, the, the hand hygiene, washing your hands regularly, making sure that you are observing the physical distancing rules and making sure that you're displaying good respiratory hygiene the, the, the less likely it is that you're going to be contacted by a contact tracer. There are certain scenarios, such as you've outlined there, that um, there is the possibility of a much more complex situation or outbreak that needs to be um, investigated. And the arrangements are in place where, when one of those situations arises, that more experienced health protection uh, professionals are able to judge those and the individual merits of that situation and decide what the appropriate response is then in terms of who is contact traced and who is not. OK. Uh, Katrine Bussey from PA. It's... <laughs> Hello, sorry, um, minor technical difficulties. Um, but we're heading into the weekend. The sun is shining. And after something like nine, 10 weeks, lockdown restrictions are starting to ease. These are all really good things. Um, but you said you were nervous. And I know you talked before about how you felt like crying when you saw the scenes of crowded beaches at Portobello. You must be going into this weekend with a real sense of, of trepidation about what could happen. Uh, yes, I am. I, I, and that's why I, I was quite open about that. I feel a bit nervous because I've said all along that whenever we start to make these changes and we have to start making them at some point and we've waited until the evidence was such that we felt we could make them safely, albeit slowly and cautiously. But any time we start this, whether it's this week, next week or a month from now, there are risks that come with that. There are risks inherent in making these changes and there are risks uh, that come from uh, the knowledge that what I might 
stand up here and announce as minimal changes uh, in a behavioural sense lead to greater changes uh, on the part of the population at large. So I do feel nervous about that, but I also have enormous trust and faith in, in the Scottish people to do the right thing, as they have been doing all along. I, I again, make no bones about saying it. I will no doubt be anxiously looking at photographs on social media and on the television over the weekend just to make sure people are not uh, acting out with the spirit of this guidance. So please... Um, Please do the right thing, not for me. Uh, do the right thing for yourself and for your loved ones uh, and for the community as a whole. If we all uh, keep within the parameters that I've set today, then we can have a weekend uh, and beyond where we can see loved ones that we've been missing, uh, but do it safely and do it in a way that means the virus continues to reduce as well. So uh, please, uh, please read that guidance and make sure you understand it before making arrangements to meet up with people at the weekend. And, and do sensible things. You know, the size of a garden is going to obviously have a, an impact on how many people can safely socially distance within it. So it's about making these really practical judgments, remembering that it is all about keeping yourself and those you love safe. So if we all operate by that principle, then hopefully my nerves will, will prove to be completely unfounded. And that's uh, what I'm keeping my fingers crossed for. Uh, Scott McNabb from the Scotsman. Thank you, uh, First Minister. Just on that, when you talk about um, Scots doing the, the right thing, phase one does seem to be um, more of a shift towards people using their, their own judgment and how they now observe the restrictions. You've addressed the, the five mile guide, but there may not be exact advice for every single situation. Does this open up the prospect of rules being interpreted differently uh, by different people? Does, it, does that concern you? And are you confident that the guidance you're publishing today is um, clear enough to, to address these issues? Um, I'm confident the guidance is clear. Um, we will uh, always keep that under review. So if there are uh, particular situations we haven't foreseen, we will try to make sure we put guidance out there to, to, to take account of that. But we are it, putting out guidance as clear as possible so that people have an understanding of the parameters and exercise their judgment within that. But uh, don't forget there are many of the lockdown rules that will still be uh, in regulation, which means that they will be the law. And again, if you go to the Scottish Government website, you get a sense of uh, what is uh, the law and, and what is guidance. So some of what I've spoken about today, the, the five mile rule, the keeping to a maximum of eight people, you know, one household at a time and one uh, per day. These are all things that we are putting in guidance. These are to, to help you. They're, they're to help you understand within these changes what would be safe and what would be not safe so that you can enjoy the benefit of these changes without taking too many risks about your own safety. So, uh, I, And I do think this is increasingly about trusting people's judgment. And I do trust the judgment of the Scottish people, of course, I do. But my job and the Scottish Government's job is to help you exercise that judgment as far as we can, because we can't, ca we can't cater for every single individual circumstance, but to give you as much information to try to uh, enable you to make the right judgments for yourself and your family. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Daily Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, if I can ask the Cabinet Secretary, um, we've heard you say repeatedly that care homes should not switch staff between different homes and that there are returners ready to help out during staff shortages. So can you tell us why Health Protection Scotland is giving different advice in a care home where there has been no cases of COVID-19, eight staff have been transferred from another home where there was an outbreak and people had died. HPS's position is if the care home is free from coronavirus for 14 days and the staff have a negative test, they can switch to another home. So has your advice changed on that? And can I also ask, um, when will we see the new health advice um, about the, the restarting of services that have been mothballed during the outbreak? Thanks very much, Vivian. From what you've just read out to me, I I'm not sure that I am seeing uh, the contradiction that you think is there. When I said very clearly, and I've repeated it, that care homes should not uh, mix staff from one to the other, that was in order to avoid 
the transmission of the virus and the risk of transmission of the virus. But what you've read out uh, seems to indicate to me, but I am happy to look at it in more detail after the briefing and come back to you in detail on it, but it indicates to me that the uh, advice that you are quoting from uh, and the situation that you're referring to, the care home provider had taken uh, steps to ensure that the staff were coming from a care home that had no active case and that they themselves had been tested, uh, which would indicate to me that those were appropriate mitigating measures. Of course, it does remain the case that we have uh, a number of individuals who are returners with social care experience ready to be deployed. And in some parts of the country, for example, in Highland, in Skye, it is NHS staff that have uh, been deployed into a particular care home uh, to help them uh, in those circumstances where other staff are absent because they have the virus. In terms of your second question, which is when will we see uh, what's going to happen in terms of uh, restarting those areas of the NHS that have been paused in order to uh, scale up for the challenge of the virus. Uh, there, there was some indication of that in the route map that was published last week. The framework that we are using for decision making will be published very shortly. There's a debate uh, in Parliament next week around that. And then gradually, safely, step by step, we will uh, indicate areas of the health service across Scotland which will begin to uh, increase the numbers, either increase the numbers of people that they are dealing with, taking account of all the appropriate uh, social distancing measures and PPE requirements and so on, or start up uh, services that have been paused in order to meet the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Um, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. Um, you mentioned the issue of couples that live apart. Um, yesterday, public health expert Linda, uh, Professor Linda Balls, um, called for clear guidance on when these couples can resume intimate physical relationships. She says it's unrealistic to expect couples to stay two metres apart, even as we go into phase one tomorrow. Um, but your route map out of lockdown currently makes no mention of when this type of contact will be allowed. Um, can you provide some clarity today or indicate when uh, when there might be some more guidance on this? Well, I, I did refer to this specifically in uh, my opening remarks. Uh, I absolutely recognise that uh, for couples uh, who, are, who are not living together, therefore not part of the same household, uh, asking them when they can meet up again to stay two metres distant uh, for obvious reasons for an extended period of time is particularly uh, difficult. Um, and, and I recognise that. And I said today we are looking specifically at that. I think uh, there will always be a limit uh, to uh, the extent to which a government uh, can or indeed should uh, issue guidance about uh, as, as you asked me, uh, people's intimate physical relationships. Uh, but nevertheless, we are looking at this issue in particular to see whether we can uh, provide some, some guidance uh, that, that allows people uh, to live their lives sensibly, but also in a way uh, that is as, as safe as possible. So I'm, I'm not giving you a, a specific date yet, but it is something I'll hand over to the, the Chief Medical Officer who might want to say a bit more that we are uh, currently considering right now. Because I realise the two metre distance uh, rule, uh, if I can call it that, is difficult for, for any uh, friends or family members, but there's a particular difficulty here that we are, um, everybody is aware of, and, and we want to see if we can uh, modify the guidance around that, hopefully in the not too distant future. But for now, I would say to everybody, uh, the safest advice we can give to people in different households, whatever your relationship is, is keep that two metres, because we don't want to provide uh, ways in which the virus can easily spread between different households. Gregor, do you want to say any more? You know, today we're taking the first steps out of probably the toughest um, public health restrictions that people in this country have ever faced. And it's, um, it's, been, it's been baby steps, and it's necessarily been baby steps that we've taken, it's been a cautious approach. Uh, and we still continue to need to observe um, some public health measures to make sure that we don't allow this virus to begin to spread again. And I recognise just how tough it is for couples who, who live apart. And as I say, very aware that it it's, um, has a big burden for, the, for them to particularly. 
uh, to, to bear over this time. So we'll be working over the, the kind of coming weeks um, in very short spell, hopefully, to be able to provide guidance that, that will give them some sort of comfort. One of uh, the Chief Medical Officer's many uh, responsibilities. Um, Tom Martin from The Express. Hi, thank you, First Minister. Um, obviously, you've given the green light, the sunbathing going ahead from tomorrow. Um, a lot of people aren't at work at the moment. People won't be going on summer holiday. Um, so given sort of Scotland's issues around skin cancer, I just wondered, um, could the CMO give some advice to people to prevent any problems arising from overdoing the furlough time? Um, that's a really good question, actually, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Gregor, but I'll just reflect on the fact that it's probably not often um, a, a First Minister of Scotland can stand up here and, and tell people that they're going to be able to sunbathe, uh, not just for the, the reasons of coming out of lockdown a little bit, but also because we are uh, hopefully going to have some uh, uncharacteristically good weather um, at the weekend, but good... Uh, uh, Sort of regulation around that to protect yourself from the obvious risks of, of sunbathing around skin cancer is very important. So I'll ask Gregor to uh, say a word about that. So it feels really strange to be able to kind of stand in front of you today and actually give you public health advice. It's not strictly related to, to kind of COVID, but, but it's, it's important nonetheless because actually, you know, Scotland um, and people from Scotland tend to have a higher risk, particularly of uh, developing many of the different types of, of, of uh, cancers that we associate with sun and with UV exposure. And, and so the advice remains unchanged that people should take the precautions that prevent, so, so making sure that they are covering up, making sure that they, um, if they've got exposed skin, um, then they're using some sort of sun protection, factor 25 or above, that they're avoiding particular times of the day when that sun exposure is its strongest, so between 11 o'clock and 3 o'clock. These are the kind of simple measures that people can take. But even beyond that, I mean, when, when things begin to get warmer, and people spend a lot of time outdoors in the sun. It's, it's really important that we make sure that we're doing other things as well to protect our health. Some of that is about making sure that we take regular fluids. And I'm not talking about alcohol here because we need to make sure that we kind of, uh, we're, we're kind of very careful with our alcohol intake. But making sure that we're keeping hydrated when we're in that sun as well is really, really important. OK, but that is an important point that uh, everybody should uh, bear in mind, particularly over, over this weekend. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Hello, thank you. Um, can I check just regarding the test and protect scheme being launched today? Um, have you got any projection for, uh, for everybody who tests positive? What, what is the projection for the average number of contacts that are likely to need to be traced? Um, and why is it the case that there are still quite a number of unanswered questions about, about the scheme as it's being launched, um, such as what, what transport will be available for people to get tested when they, they don't have their own car or access to a car, um, and who, who will be eligible for, for hotel rooms and how will they, they get that if they have nowhere to self-isolate? I'm not sure these are unanswered questions. These are things that will be um, you know, determined as we know what the, the needs of, of people are. So if people need help with food or medicine uh, or accommodation, uh, then you know, the helpline that we have been using for uh, people vulnerable during the lockdown is available for them to, to access that. So you know, these arrangements are there. Uh, what we have said is this is a service we will continue to enhance. I said on Tuesday, one of the enhancements we will be making over the next few weeks is to expand uh, local access to testing so that people have more uh, opportunities to, to get tested at home or in their local community. And I, by that, I don't mean home testing kits. I mean people that can go to your home or your local community and test you. So these are not unanswered questions. They are uh, areas that we'll continue to build into to the service as we go forward. Um, I'll hand over to, to the Health Secretary. Uh, what I'd say on contacts is that right now, if we're all following the guidance, the number of contacts that any of us should be having should be much, much lower than would be the case in normal times because we shouldn't be coming within two metres uh, of, of somebody in another household for 15 minutes or more. So I think it's important to bear uh, that in mind. Jean. Uh, just on the, the point about support, if you like, um, so uh, people will know about the significant support services that with uh, our colleagues in local government and with uh, charities and other organisations has been put in place for that group of individuals who are particularly vulnerable uh, to the virus and its impact on them and their health, the, the group who are currently shielding. 
that we built on that uh, operation and that will encompass now the support that might be needed to anyone who is asked to isolate uh, for a period of time, the seven days or the 14 days, who can't get the help that they might need in terms of food or medicines from family or friends. And that comes through the local health, uh, public health partnerships. So in each part of the country, there will be a consistency of what's available, but the particular local arrangements may vary. And that includes, for example, local arrangements that are there to provide quality accommodation should someone be in a position where their own circumstances mean that it is very difficult to isolate in their own household. And so uh, the support will be there, but it will, it will be quality support, but it may differ from one local authority area to another. And that's why uh, we don't set out exactly uh, what accommodation will be available? Will it be a house? Will it be a hotel? Uh, because it needs to go with what are the local arrangements, but it will be available and it will be quality support there for anyone who's asked to isolate who then needs that. Okay, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Hello there. Uh, Durham Constabulary have just uh, released a statement on Dominic Cummings. Um, they, they said that if they'd caught him driving to Bernard Castle, they would have sent him back to the address he came from in Durham and advised him of the, the dangers of driving during a pandemic. Um, they have concluded that he did breach lockdown rules. So given that a cornerstone of Boris Johnson's defence was that he was acting within the rules, does this amplify your call for Mr Cummings to resign? And given that he shares the same COBRA meetings as you um, and the whole point of the Four Nations Action Plan was simplicity of message and that message now appears to be it doesn't matter if you breach lockdown is the Four Nations Action Plan now effectively dead? Um, on the, the first part of your question and you know I obviously trust uh, what you've just read out to me there from Durham Police, but I'm answering this not having seen that for myself, so just uh, to, to make that obvious caveat. Um, I think Dominic Cummings should no longer uh, be in post. I thought that uh, at the weekend, and I certainly uh, continue to think that uh, that is a matter for the Prime Minister, but I, I think if the Prime Minister is putting the integrity and trust in the vital public health message that he is seeking to communicate and all of us are seeking to communicate first, then uh, he will take action that means that Dominic Cummins doesn't continue to distract uh, from that. Um, and I said on Monday that I think it is wrong that he puts political interest ahead of, of that public health interest. That, though, is a matter for him. My job is to make sure that the public health messages that I'm communicating to people across Scotland are as clear as I can possibly make them. We will continue to cooperate where it is appropriate and, and necessary and mutually beneficial on a four nations basis. And I've always said that there is no aspect of handling this virus for me that is political or constitutional in any way. I just want to do what is right for uh, you, the people of Scotland, and everything I can to suppress this virus and, and get us back to some kind of normality. That's what will continue to guide my actions. And, uh, you know, that means I have to set out the changes I think we should make and the public health messages uh, that we need to communicate. So these public health messages are the ones that we are communicating uh, here. Uh, these are the ones that people in Scotland, I hope, will pay heed to. And I suppose my only point would be this. I, I've, my views are are known on Dominic Cummings, but I don't want to continue to talk about Dominic Cummings because every sentence I utter about him is a sentence I'm not uttering about the, the advice that I want people in Scotland to follow. So please, uh, for your public health advice and what you should be doing and not doing, listen to us here, go onto the Scottish Government website, NHS Inform, the, the sources of advice are there, people have been following them so far, please continue to do so. Derek Keeley from the PNJ. Thank you, First Minister. There have been reports that Boris Johnson has ordered a review of the two-metre physical distancing rule, um, possibly to reduce that in order to help pubs and restaurants reopen. Is that something that's being considered at all in Scotland? And if the UK government does ease that rule, would you expect to see Scotland uh, follow suit? Uh, right now, the two-metre rule is the one that I'm asking people to follow. If we decide for uh, reasons of scientific uh, 
evidence and advice to change that. I will stand up here and tell people that we're changing that and I will set out why. Uh, but right now, uh, it's the two metre rule uh, that I'm asking people to follow. It is true that some countries uh, have a, a different distance, a metre or a metre and a half, but I, I certainly have not been given advice that we should change that right now. Um, and we will continue to look at the evidence and, and uh, I will continue to consider any advice that I do get. But yeah, until such times as we change it, and there is no plans to do that at the moment, two metres is the, the, the distance that I am asking people to abide by. Gregor, do you want to say more about it? No, I mean, the, the reason we've got a two metre rule like that just now is because that's what the evidence suggested that we should have, and that's what we should apply in this country. And if the evidence changes, if the evidence, uh, and through learning, we... we we kind of um, are able to kind of modify that in any way, then then, then we should do so. But at the moment, uh, as I say, the, the evidence suggests that we should continue with the two metre rule. Particularly at this stage, when everything we have to do still needs to be cautious and precautionary, um, I would you know take a lot of convincing that we change things that we have been like this, that we have been sticking to so far. So uh, stick to uh, the rules that we are uh, asking you to uh, until such times as for good reason they, they change. Libby Brooks from The Guardian. Hello, First Minister. Um, just returning to the concerns about people possibly flocking to beauty spots over the weekend, I was just wondering if you had any guidance for national parks who are sort of perhaps at the minute struggling to decide whether to open car park, reopen car parks or toilets and those sorts of facilities, or local businesses around there who are again wondering whether to reopen so that they can actually start making some money or you know, wanting to stay closed to protect their local communities. Uh, so, for national parks, this has been a decision uh, at the outset around car parks and toilets for national parks for them. Uh, but my advice to them would not to be changing uh, to, to change uh, the, the arrangements at this stage. So, if your car parks have been closed uh, and your public toilets have been closed, keep them uh, closed for now. Is my advice. Um, and similarly, for businesses who are perhaps you know looking to uh, sell goods and services to people again, keep within. A local area uh, don't uh, go out with your local area the five mile rule is the one we want people to follow uh, we do not and i can't say this strongly enough we do not want to see people flocking to, to tourist spots um, I, i'm as desperate as anybody to get our tourist industry up and running again i look forward fervently to the day that we're encouraging people to go to the the beautiful uh, wonderful parts of our country but that is not right now and and it's not right now for very good reasons so please just don't do it um, because if you do and the risks materialise we're all going to set this whole process back and it's just not worth it at this stage. Uh, Tom Gordon from the Herald. Hello First Minister. Hello. Hello there. I've got some questions, um, perhaps for yourself or the CMO, about the progress of the next phase. Um, the Scottish Government produces a lot of daily data on testing and events uh, in care homes, etc. What data from the Test and Protect system will be added to those daily data? Um, can you also help us understand exactly how we can monitor whether this next phase is progressing safely or not? Do we still expect the downward trends to continue downward or should we expect them to plateau or possibly even go up a little bit? And if so, at what point do the alarm bells start ringing exactly? Uh, and finally, um, is three weeks sufficient to tell whether things are progressing safely? Because we know the virus tends to burn below the radar and then explode. Um, is three weeks sufficient? OK, I'll uh, have a quick go at those questions, but both Gregor and, and Jean might want to say a little bit more. So we will be publishing data from Test and Protect and we will set out, um, I hope, next week uh, what that data will be, certainly in the early phases, although we would look to develop it as the, the system uh, develops and, and enhances over the next few weeks. Um, secondly, uh, we, we will monitor the impact of these changes through the data that you know, I've, I've been talking about all along, the impact on the R number, uh, the incidence and prevalence of cases, but also these supplementary measures around uh, 
hospital admissions, ICU admissions, and of course, uh, the number of people dying. Um, three weeks, is, is it long enough? We know, and this is where I will hand over to Gregor, um, that the incubation period of this would suggest that if there is going to be an impact from changes, it is two to three weeks in which you would see that because of the, the period of incubation. Um, but you know, we, we've said all along that three weeks right now is a guide. It doesn't mean that we will automatically move into uh, the, the next phase after three weeks. If we get to that three-week review stage and we think we don't yet have enough evidence, that would be a, a possible reason for not moving at that stage. Likewise, if we've got really good evidence, we, we might move a bit quicker. So these are things we're going to have to judge as we go, and, and it's important that, that we do so. Uh, Gregor, do you want to say a bit more about that? And then I don't know, Jim, whether you want to say more about test and protect. So, so I'm really pleased to hear your recognition of the need to, to kind of monitor progress as we go along, because I think that's really important. And, and there's a lot of the data that we already use, we'll continue to use. Um, it's really important that we, we track that over time, particularly um, the, the kind of proportions of tests that, that are being positive uh, as a whole. But, but, but um, when you think about it, because we're going to be testing many more people, potentially, we might see fluctuations in, in daily ranges. So, so we can't rely on simply that alone. There's going to be a range of measures that we examine. And, and we feed that into the modelling systems that we now have in place that people are becoming much more familiar with. And that gives us a sense of exactly how things progress in the country. And, and the question as to how long does it take to get a feel for that? Well, yes, I agree. It's, it's, it's going to take at least two to three weeks for us to get a proper feel as to what any impact um, any particular change in the restrictions has in, in terms of the, the, the numbers of cases that are coming forward. Why does it take that long? Well, it takes that long because of the life cycle that we know of this virus, the way that when people mix together, it can be up to 14 days after that before we start to see the signs and the symptoms of uh, the, the disease we associate with this virus, COVID-19, um, to, to actually start to come through. Before I hand over to Jean, just to, as a reminder both to journalists and, and to the public, we're now every Thursday publishing a paper that sets out the up-to-date R number and some of these estimates that we're making. I think today's should have been published just as we started this briefing, but if you're interested, that goes into a bit more detail about uh, what evidence we're looking at, how that is modelled and calculated, and, and that will now be uh, published every Thursday round about lunchtime. Jean. As the First Minister said, we're looking at exactly what data we will publish and with what frequency so that it um, makes sense. But the kind of data that uh, is of importance is uh, the number of people who have contacted us and for whom a test has been booked, the test turnaround time. Um, I think in a previous briefing, uh, First Minister covered the importance of speed in all of this. So if you have those symptoms to phone right away or go onto that NHS informed website right away and be isolating right away as quickly as you can. Uh, the test turnaround time, therefore, is really important in that. The uh, number of contacts uh, that uh, and how that compares with uh, what our expectation was, where in the country uh, these uh, issues are raising, these cases are raising, and the level over time, the level of support that is required uh, from people to help them and whether or not that will allow us to uh, make uh, decisions on flexing to determine whether or not there are areas of support that we need to uh, ensure there is more of or areas that we might not need. Uh, so all of that uh, as data uh, and more, I suspect, that we will look to gather, certainly for the operation of uh, test and protect and then uh, to publish so that people can see how it's doing. And the one other point I would make is, of course, in all of this, whilst we are looking at restarting the health service, we are retaining an important level of capacity to cope with cases of COVID-19. So it's not the case that as we introduce test and protect, we stop being ready in the health service to cope with cases. We manage both so that we are able to give people the care, the protection, and the support that they need. Okay. Uh, just very, very quickly mm -hmm. as a follow-up, can you just tell us, tell the country whether all these downward trends will keep going downwards? Um, or if they do go up a little bit, does that mean a second wave is inevitable? Or might it just be kind of an acceptable fluctuation? Because people might start freaking out if the numbers go back up. Uh, that, that being a technical term, I, I assume. Um, yeah, look, look, I understand why people want me to give categoric answers to that, but I, I can't give categoric answers. Will all of these trends continue to go downwards? I fervently hope so, but I cannot guarantee that. 
Um, equally, if we start to see slight increases, will that mean that we have to go backwards completely again? We have to judge that. And will a, is a second wave inevitable? I, I take the view nothing is inevitable, but I said last week in Parliament that we absolutely cannot ignore the risk, the very real risk, uh, not just in Scotland or the UK, but globally, of a second wave of this when we get back into the, the autumn and, and winter. Uh, so I can't give absolute assurances uh, about any aspects of that. The one thing I would say, though, and I think it's really important, I, I saw somebody from the WHO make this point the other day, that people talk a lot about we'll have a second wave when we get to the autumn and winter, and that is a real worry. But that doesn't mean we, there's no risk of uh, another wave before then. Um, and if we take our foot off this brake too quickly, if we all start to go about our daily business too much, then we could see uh, an increase in cases very, very quickly. So all of this, to some extent, uh, to a large extent right now, comes down to what we do. Uh, we've managed to make this progress because we've all complied with these rules. We can't live like this forever. But as we come out of this very restrictive lockdown, if we continue to follow the basic hygiene, hygiene distancing advice, then we can have an impact on whether we see it increase again or not. Uh, Paul Malik from the Courier, we have three questions uh, left. I know we're taking a bit longer today, but uh, three questions left. And the first of those is Paul Malik. Thank you, First Minister. Um, a question is about the test and protect. Will health workers in the community, GPs, nurses, carers, etc., be considered a contact by tracers if they are only wearing basic levels of PPE, i.e. Uh, a mask and gloves? Uh, and if so, what is the contingency if a patient has attended a GP surgery 48 hours before they have provided a positive test? Um, are staff at that surgery all expected to self-isolate and go home? Um, and with that in mind, will there be an established level of PPE for health workers to wear that are not in hospitals or traditional um, zones where, where COVID-19 is being treated? And also, will there be people exempt from being identified as tracers as we move on? I'm not quite sure I understand the last part of your question, but um, I'm happy to answer it later if we can get some clarity about people being exempt from being tracers. It's not, not as tracers, exempt right. as being identified as contacts. Ex I Again, I'm not sure why anybody would be exempt from being identified as contacts. If you are a contact, then it's important that you are, are traced and, and given the appropriate advice. But if I'm misunderstanding that question, you can let me know later. On the uh, issues of who will be a contact, I think we've set out the definitions there. Um, I don't know whether Greg has got anything to ask, uh, particularly about healthcare workers, and then Jean briefly on PPE. Okay, so, so in terms of, um, I, I spoke earlier on about the, the, that there are certain more complex scenarios that we would want to be able to assess on an individual basis, and that might be scenarios that involves a healthcare setting, such as a GP practice or, 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 or some other kind of um, healthcare setting. And in that case, the, the contact tracing process would take uh, acknowledgement of that, what type of protection was being worn, and there's, there's very firm guidance that the Cabinet Secretary will no doubt uh, touch upon as to what guidance should be worn in those scenarios. Um, but, but all that will be considered as part of that judgment that's made as to um, what advice is given to each one of those contacts. Uh, and Jean, do you want to quickly cover PPE? Just quickly on that, as the Chief Medical Officer said, there is really clear guidance on the type of PPE that should be worn in a range of different clinical scenarios, and we would expect that to be uh, continue to be followed as it is being followed just now. We already provide uh, PPE to uh, GP practices and community health services, and we will continue to do that to make sure that they have the PPE that they need in order to protect both staff and patients. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Learmans from The National. Thanks, First Minister. Um, can I ask a, a very specific and possibly stupid question here about test protect and the children of parents who are separated? Um, the lockdown legislation allows those children to move between parents. Um, will that still be the case if one of those parents is self-isolating or will it be the case that if a parent is told to self-isolate and the child will have to remain with whichever parent they were with at the time, even the parent who is self-isolating is an instant asymptomatic contact rather than an index case? Um, it's most definitely not a stupid question, Andrew. It's a, a very important question. I'm going to hesitate. I'll, I don't know whether Gregor will be able to answer. I'm, I'm going to hesitate to try to answer it in detail right now because I'd want to go away and check that uh, I was given the right guidance. And we will certainly, if we need to put some specific guidance on the website, we will do that. But I think these are really difficult scenarios that you're outlining here, aren't they? When, the, when there's the potential for um, that, that, that kind of... Um, uh, uh, 
passage of people from one household to another that's established for very good um, uh, reasons. And, and I think, again, we need to judge each one of those on its um, individual merits. There is um, always the potential that, that people have already been exposed uh, if an individual tests positive and that they would be contacted anyway. But by and large, what we're trying to do, I think this is really important just to emphasise again, is to, to break those chains of transmission between um, households. So, so again, if there, if there is the potential for someone who has tested positive, they shouldn't be, uh, they, they should be kind of um, following the, 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 the kind of guidance for isolating at that point in time. If it's someone who's within a household who has been advised to isolate, it's, it's only the person who's been advised to isolate and not the rest of the household who um, should stay within the house. So, for instance, um, if um, someone was to be contacted because they've been um, uh, judged to be a contact of, of, of someone uh, for, for one of those kind of three categories that I spoke of, um, and, and they're advised to isolate for 14 days, the rest of the members of their household don't need to go on and isolate themselves unless the person develops symptoms, in which case the rest of the household should isolate at that point in time. OK, but we'll have a look, and if, if the current guidance uh, doesn't closely enough and in detail enough cover the situation of, of a child that lives between two parents, we'll make sure that there's some additional guidance there just to... Uh, to help people uh, understand what they should and shouldn't be doing, because it is an important point. Uh, last question now is from Muir Dickey from the Financial Times. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, the Financial Times today published analysis that shows the uh, excess deaths during the pandemic in the UK, including Scotland, at the highest among countries with comparable statistics. Um, what do you think this high level of excess deaths in Scotland um, uh, what, what's your, your view of it and what do you think it tells us about the Scottish Government's uh, handling of the epidemic? Well, I should say, first of all, um, I don't think there's any acceptable level of excess deaths and, and I never will, nor do I think it is or, or should ever be reduced to some kind of competition. So my next sentence shouldn't be seen in that context. Uh, excess deaths in Scotland are lower than in England, um, although in my view, they are still uh, much higher than we would want them to be because there is no acceptable level, but they are lower than uh, the, the excess deaths in England. Uh, and the final point I would make, uh, in addition to, I don't think there is an acceptable level, is certainly you know, those who advise me uh, caution me against making uh, definitive comparisons between different countries, um, generally to some extent, because there are still differences in, in how these things are measured and reported, but I think more fundamentally, caution against doing it at this stage because we are not yet through this pandemic and I, I don't think there will be a single uh, government anywhere in the world uh, that if it is wise will be you know declaring some kind of victory uh, against this virus we are not yet through this yet so we have to keep focused on trying to make sure that we minimize its impact as much as possible and uh, minimise the number of people who are losing their lives. But, but excess deaths in Scotland are uh, lower. They are also, as I think uh, is the case across the UK now, uh, they are also declining. Um, and the NR NRS report for Scotland this week uh, showed that decline for now four weeks in a row. Do you want to add anything? Sorry. Uh, oh. oh, Simon, did I Sorry, miss I you out? Um, yeah, what, what it was, my You're not on my email list. was mislaid. So, All right, um, you're not on my list, but since, team. since it's the Daily Telegraph, I'll make a special <laughs> exemption and allow um, you to yeah. come in late. Um, apologies, your press team asked me to unmute myself after Muir had finished. I didn't realise you were going to pass I, over. I can't believe my press team ever told the Daily Telegraph to unmute itself, but um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> never. Um, I was just going to ask, I have an email from my colleague Gordon Rayner in the lobby saying that the Prime Minister's later holding a first call with the First Ministers to, to announce... The, to discuss the lockdown measures he'll be announcing for down there later on. Um, are you going to be telling him to be a bit more clear that he's talking about England only? Because he hasn't really been that clear in the, in the announcements he's made so far. And are, are you going to uh, raise the Dominic Cummings issue and the impact that's had on public health messaging directly with him? Um, and on a linked issue, um, can you give me a bit of a flavour of how 
um, this is going to be policed this weekend if people do congregate in, in parks and beaches. OK, um, Simon, I am due to have a, a discussion with the Prime Minister and the other First Ministers in precisely 11 minutes' time, so I'm sure the Daily Telegraph would not want to be responsible for making me late uh, for that discussion. Uh, so I'll be relatively brief in, in answering your questions. Uh, I will... Um, I, as uh, I have done before, uh, ask the Prime Minister when he's talking about lockdown and the lifting of restrictions to make clear that he is talking about England alone. That is not a political point. It's not a constitutional point. It's a point about the importance of the clarity of public messaging. Um, he knows, I suspect, my views on Dominic Cummings. I, you weren't uh, perhaps on the call when I said this. I don't want to... My, my views on Dominic Cummings are clear, but I don't want to spend time talking about Dominic Cummings because I've got a job to do to make sure we continue to take the right decisions. So I'm not going to uh, waste time on a call like that uh, telling the Prime Minister what I'm sure he already knows. And lastly, in terms of uh, policing... Uh, the police will continue to do as they have done all along, which is police uh, sensitively and proportionately and appropriately. Uh, some of what I've talked about today is not the letter of the law, it's guidance, uh, but there are still uh, aspects of this that are in the law and you can find all that information on the Scottish Government website, but the police will continue to try to uh, encourage people where they're perhaps not doing the right thing uh, not deliberately, but because they, they are inadvertently doing that, encourage people to do the right thing. And people, by and large, have done the right thing all along, and I would continue them to continue to do, uh, encourage them to continue to do that. Um, that uh, concludes the questions uh, for today. Can I uh, thank Gregor and Jean for joining me, thank Robert, uh, our BSL interpreter, today for uh, his help in making sure this briefing is accessible. Um, and thank you for joining us. We've taken longer than normal today, but I hope you agree for good reason. Um, I really do want to ask you to read the guidance. Uh, if you need to listen back to this uh, later on or to aspects of it, just to make sure that you do understand the parameters that we are encouraging you to operate within. Um, look forward to seeing friends and family over the next few days that you haven't seen for a while. Enjoy it. The sun hopefully will be shining, but please do it safely um, and uh, follow the, the guidance that we're setting out because we're not doing it to make your life difficult. Uh, we're doing it for good reasons about health, safety and protection. And my last point really, uh, well, yeah, my last point is remember that as we slowly come out of this lockdown, and it is slow and it's careful and it's cautious, some of the fundamentals will matter even more. And what are those? Two metres physical distancing, washing your hands uh, regularly and thoroughly, uh, avoiding touching hard surfaces that other people have been touching, but when you do, wash them and wash your hands. All of that stuff becomes even more important uh, as we go into this next phase. So please read the guidance, stick to the rules, and... Uh, Tomorrow, because these changes don't take effect today, tomorrow uh, I hope you enjoy the benefit of these changes. I will be back here tomorrow at the usual time, but for now, thank you very much for joining us.